work in my best voice. No idea if I just started the right meeting. Uh, Is anyone waiting? Oh, yeah. Sherry. Oh, good. Okay. So. Hi, Rabbi. Hi. How are How you? Have you been? Good. Very good. How are you? Are you you're back home now? I see. Yes. 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 yes Hi, Sherry. You. Hi, Liz. How you doing? I'm hanging in. How are you? I made your hair is beautiful. I'm sorry. You made me what? Passing through Philadelphia. When are you doing that? Um, sometime in April. Oh, you're going to the airport? My cousin was living in Jacksonville. His wife was living in Philadelphia. And now he's moving back to Philadelphia. Aha. Uh -huh. so I may go do a flyby. That might be fun. I, I don't know that I'd see you because I don't see anybody, but <laughs> oh, that's I can right. wave to you. Yes, I'll wave. Okay, good. <laughs> that, that'll work. Where are you going to stay at their house or apartment or whatever? Uh, my cousin Where do they live? And she's in Croton on Hudson. Wait, that's in New York. Yes. I'm confused. <laughs> There's a bunch oh, of you're not staying in Philadelphia? No. Is that your book? I'm probably if oh, I Oh, you're just coming through to pick up a cousin, go on to Croton. And my cousin from Connecticut is coming. It's a cousins club meeting. Oh, nice. That's fantastic. Because we haven't seen each other in years. I used to live right near Croton. Did you? Yeah, I lived in Chappaqua. It's not far. Yeah, that's not far. I used to take the train to Chicago from the Croton station because it's fast. Wow. Enough. You don't have to go to New York. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Maybe I'll take the train. Yeah, I'll the train's the, great. Take the train. I love the train. I used to love the train. I, I never flew, so the train was my favorite. <laughs> I don't know if it's any good now, to be honest with you. How, how long is the train ride from Croton to Chicago? Well, I only know pre-COVID. I don't know what goes on now. Um, it might have been like 17 hours, and it was normally from the morning until the next, uh, well, probably afternoon till the next morning, something like that. Let so you could sleep on the train. Oh, I have to think about that. That sounds like fun. Yeah, so, I, yeah, it was fun. I don't know if it's anything like that now. I can't say. <laughs> so. Okay, but it's something to look into. I still have a couple. Yeah, of absolutely, it gives you something to do. Yeah, absolutely. Then I you don't have to go hanging out at the airport. Still and read a book. That would yeah. Be no, it was fun. It was fun, and they may have maybe they have those cars where you can you know they're. I don't know what they have. I don't know anything anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I know that feeling. They've changed the whole system since they used to have it. What? Right. I know the feeling. I, yes. Especially anyway, I'm actually showing my person on here. So I, since nobody's looking at me, I guess I'll take my person off. Okay. <laughs> I can see okay. you. I can see you. Still oh, can you see. can? Okay, then I'll leave my person on. Okay. Okay. There you go. Why not? Yeah, see you, except that the rabbi had the thing turned towards the wall. Towards you. Didn't I have it torn? I don't know. Towards I don't you? think so. It doesn't matter. <laughs> no, because eventually we'll start class. 
That's right. That Lois, Linda is on, and Lois is on. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hi, I see it. Hi. Yeah. I see Sherry. I see. Yes. Hi, it's good there to see go. everybody. Is Liz there? Tell her hi. You, you know I, what I did? I what? put in I put in the uh, number for the Rambam class. That's why it was telling ah. me he's in another meeting. <laughs> yes, so. that would make sense. Yeah. And that's why it said I had another meeting. Also, <laughs> I was trying to figure out why did it say? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, my bad. No. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> We're not the first. You won't be the last. <laughs> right. Linda, you're, you're, there you go. You're All right. Ready. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to leave a few minutes early. Just letting you guys know. Okay. Sorry. All right. Not a problem. Okay. Um, today, what I thought we would do is uh, something Purim related. Oh. A little something Purim related, but also with some text. Um. So we're going to go to Achremot. We're going to go to, this is Leviticus chapter 16. Leviticus chapter 16, Vayikra 16. Look at that. that was it wasn't that long I ago. Up, I came up to nine. That was the there you go. It hasn't been... It's not that far ago that we were at Leviticus 16. Please repeat chapter 16, what verse? So I didn't say verse yet, but it's Leviticus chapter 16. But we are going to um, start with verse five. The, re the reason we're looking at this uh, related to Purim is because of a teaching of Rabbi Isaac Luria. Rabbi Isaac Luria made the point that Yom Kippurim is a day like Purim. Kippurim. It's a day like Purim. So whenever you see um, one of these teachings, it's important to remember that these teachings point towards something. They aren't necessarily the thing itself. They don't necessarily contain all the information themselves. A lot of times they're pointing towards something. There's an expectation that you're going to look at what they're pointing at and do some investigating yourself. In other words, this would be like uh, pointing in general. This is when somebody, if somebody doesn't understand what pointing is, they spend all their time looking at the finger, not realizing that the finger is giving them directions. So if somebody is pointing towards something and somebody else just looks at the finger, you miss the point. So this is this is the case with deep teachings. Even midrash. This is this is the case with midrash. If you spend your whole time on the words that are written, you miss the point of the midrash. The midrash is very often pointing at something. It's not the thing itself. So so it is with even deeper teachings like this. That um, so he is making a comparison between Purim and Yom Kippur and. It begins with the fact that Kippurim means like Purim. So he's, it's a word play. It's a kind of pun. But not only, not only is it a pun, but um, it, uh, there's, as we're going to see, there is more to it if you start looking there. So let's look at this section. Is it 16, right? So it's chapter 16, it's verse five. Uh, uh, no, no, take, do, do verse seven. I'm sorry, verse seven. Okay. The two he goats? Yeah. Okay. 
He shall take the two he goats and stand them before Hashem at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Aaron shall place lots upon the two he goats, one lot for Hashem and one lot for Azizel. Aaron shall bring near the he goat designated by lot for Hashem and make it a sin offering. And the he goat designated by the lot for Azizel shall be stood alive before Hashem to provide atonement through it, to send it to Azizel to the wilderness. Aaron shall bring near his own sin offering bull and he okay. shall provide atonement for himself and for his household. Then he shall slaughter his own sin offering. Okay. So these are two goats. Um, he takes the two goats and he stands them before the for the building of the Mishkan, before the tent of meeting. Um, and there is some kind of a lot, a lottery. Mm -hmm. And one, so I've seen, they, they're actually at the uh, Temple Institute in Jerusalem, they've made these lots. It's a box which has two um, wooden, I think they're wooden boards that, and the coin takes one and puts it with one of the goats, takes the other and puts it with the other goat. One of them says La Hashem, and one says La Azazel. Um, and so these are, we're told in the, in the Talmud that these are meant to be identical goats. Um, and so one of them is going to be offered as a sacrifice on the altar in the base of Mikdash and the, or, the, or the Mishkan. And the other one is going to be taken to this cliff and uh, pushed off this cliff. That's the one, La Zazel. <laughs> Doesn't that kill him? He dies. Pushing off the cliff. He dies. Um, he, this, the term scapegoat comes ah. from this, uh, from this um, procedure. Um, okay, so the word here used for lot or lottery is goral. Goral. Um, So now we're going to go to Megillus Esther. So I happen to have it. You it, you may not have it. In some in in uh, the Archgar ones, there there is a Megillus Esther in the back. I don't know in that eight sign if there's. A, I'm I'm assuming there must be because if you if you are designing a furnish to be used in shul. Today's my lucky day. You got <laughs> Esther. The right to it. You are. You're on a roll. Um, Is it poor in the Megillah for Lot? Yeah, but it does say, it, it doesn't just say poor. Oh, okay. Um, It's in, I'm assuming it's in. Yeah, it's in chapter three of Esther. Um, verse seven. So in chapter three, verse seven. I'm missing something here. Do you have chapter three? Not yet. Went right, must have gone right by it. Yeah, I did go. So I'll read it. Okay, 
Okay. But Chodesh Harishon, who Chodesh Nisan, the Shna Shtemas Esrei Lamelech Achashverosh, in the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of Achashverosh, he peeled poor, he drew a lot or dropped a lot. Hu ha goral, that is the goral. That is the, uh, so poor is a lottery, but it's how it says it. It says, he peel poor, hu ha goral. It is the lottery. Lifnei Haman, before Haman, miyom, liyom, umichodesh lechodesh. So it went through days, it went through months, shnei masar, hu chodesh adar. And it came out in the month of Adar. <clears throat> but it's that language. He, yeah. he threw a poor, and it was, and it is Hagoral. It is the Goral. So I'm suggesting if you're following the trail, if you're like looking at where the finger is pointed to, and uh, the Arizal says to you, Purim is. Uh, Yom Kippur is like Purim. So, and you're just looking at similarities between the two. This is one of those ones that would be very striking. They yeah. both have lots. They both have lottery. And, and this one, the one in the Megillah, even you could imagine, <laughs> you know, if you just step back a little bit and widen your imagination you could even hear it saying this poor is the goral this is the goral this is the same yeah. thing as the goral that you did at um at purim um yeah, it, it emphasizes that it, it says poor and then it says in parentheses that is the lot right the, the lot yeah the lot yeah Right, so that's one of the wonderful sort of connections between the two, especially because this lot at, in the Megillah, the lottery for Purim is not just a detail of the story. The name of the holiday comes from this lot. This, there's something about the lottery at Purim that, gave it its name, gave the holiday its name. Of all the various things that could have been mentioned about that holiday, yeah. all the different names you might have chosen that reflect the character of the day, for some reason, the character of the day ends up getting reflected in that word, poor, the word Purim, lottery. So you... you Again, you have this kind of textual connection between the two, and we recognize those goat offerings as something particularly important for Yom Kippur, but for Purim, it's like the most important detail, apparently. It's the one that gives the holiday its name. Right. If you think about other similarities there's a there's another one this one isn't as obvious in the text um towards the end of the megillah it says when it's describing what is going to be the holiday so this is in the aftermath of the drama So this would be in, in chapter nine. So it's uh, verse, verse 20. 
So it says, and Mordechai wrote these words and sent scrolls to the Jews in all the different provinces of the king of Ahasuerus, those near and far. To keep the 14th um, and the 15th every year. These are the days where the Jews rested from their enemies. It's a day that went from sadness to joy, from mourning to celebration. So they should be you may mishta the simcha days of of feasting and joy. Umishloach manos ishlo sending gifts each one to his friend. Umatos levyonim and gifts for the poor. Bekibel a Yehudim as asher echilu lasos veis asher kos of Mordechai Eliam and the Jews accepted that which they began and what Mordechai had written to them. Because Haman ben Amdasa Agagi, the one who had plotted against the Jews, wanted to destroy them. The Hepil poor who Hagorao, again that phrase. Mm -hmm. And he cast lots, the lottery, Lehumam Labdeim, to destroy them. Ubovo Alifne Amelach, Omari Masefer, Yoshu Machshav Tolorash, Echishev Al Yudim Al Rosho. But when Esther came to the king, doesn't actually say her name explicitly, but when she came, when she came before the king, um, he gave orders uh, to make what, what Haman wanted to happen, happen back to him, and he and his children were hung on the tree. Al Kain Kurli Yami Maila Purim Al Shema Pur. That's why Purim, it's called Purim because of the poor, the lottery. Al Kain Al Kol Divrei Ageris Azos. And uh, everything in this letter, Maro Al Kacho Magialen, Kimu Vikiblu Ha Yehudim Alehem. So everything that was listed in this letter, it says Kimu Vikiblu. Um, they took upon themselves, accepted upon themselves and their children and everybody that, that is connected to them, uh, that these days should be as was written in their appropriate time every year. Um, and they are remembered and, they are, and these various things are done in every generation, family by family, province by province, city by city. Um, these days of Purim will not pass from the Jews and they will be remembered, um, you know, even by their children. It will never stop. So, um, again, it emphasizes the, the lottery and specifically that the holiday is given its name because of that lottery. But it mentions, it has this phrase, Kimu Vikiblu Hayehudim. The Jews accept upon themselves. Um, and this phrase is quoted in the Talmud. The Talmud says that it, it, there was a re-accepting of the Torah that happens at Purim. Uh, it's sort of an unusual piece of Agadita. It's in the Gemara and Shabbos. And the Gemara quotes a verse which says that the Jews camped by the mountain. But if you read the verse literally, it means the Jews camped underneath the mountain. So the Midrash says what happened was God lifted the mountain over their head. <laughs> he lifted the mountain over their head. And he said, if you accept the Torah, good. And if not, this is going to be your burial place. So the Gemara goes on to say, if that's true, that there was coercion when we originally accepted the Torah, then how is it legally binding? After all, coercion, if you're coerced into an agreement, the, these agreements are, are considered null and void. Right. So if there was coercion, so the Gemara says, you're right until Purim, but at Purim, 
they re-accept the Torah, not out of coercion. And so from Purim on, uh, you no longer have a claim of coercion. This is a shocking Gemara. The whole, everything about it is shocking, which the Gemara likes to do. Um, but, uh, but you, and when it says that they re-accepted at Purim, they quote this verse, ki move kiblu, like Kabbalat HaTorah, Kabbalat HaTorah. So this is kiblu, they accepted it. So that which they had originally accepted under coercion, they're now accepting of their own volition. So without getting into, because it, that, that just by itself, that, that Gemara deserves a lot of time and attention, but without going into that, just the notion that there is a Kabbalah Torah, there's an accepting of Torah on Purim, some kind of accepting of Torah on Purim, um, which, which is another similarity between Purim and Yom Kippur. Because, and again, neither of these are overt in the verse, but right. if you've been, you know, if you're in yeshiva for a long time, there, you're, you're getting these uh, teachings over and over and over again, and they start to come together. So here, again, according to the Gemara, or we could call it Midrash, it's a, it's a Agatic Gemara, um, there is an acceptance of the Torah on Purim. Also, if you follow through this is not overt this is not overt but if you follow the whole thing with the golden calf which is coming up in this next not in this next week's Torah portion not not this week's but next week's Torah portion <clears throat> so um if you so at the time of the golden calf so what has happened is this Moshe went up on the mountain and God spoke the 10 statements, okay? Then Moshe is staying up there and he's going to bring down the tablets. That, so that's 40 days later, he brings down the tablets. That's when the golden calf happens. So now he goes back up and he's pleading on behalf of the people so for God to spare the people. Then eventually he goes up again and he's gonna come down with second tablets. If you, if, if you count all the days, the, the way they're presented, it ends up that when he comes down with the second tablets, it's Yom Kippur. It's Yom Kippur. So again, this is not overtly mentioned in Yom Kippur. We'll call this at the deeper, we'll call this at the next level. These are things that are mentioned with regard to both of these holidays. and they are a little bit beneath the surface. In order to figure this out with Yom Kippur, you'd have to keep track of all the days as, as, as being discussed. Uh, and it would work out that Moshe is coming down with the tablets on Yom Kippur, if the second tablets. And you'd have to pay attention to the Midrash, um, to the Gemara uh, that says that God held the mountain over them and that only in Purim did they re-accept it, this chemo the Kiblu? But I'm going to suggest to you that these, I would call these just below the surface because they're, they're, they're sort of there. There's, there's some kind of fragrance of them that rises up to the text, even if it's not overt in the text. So it's, it's a kind of next layer stuff. So you have, right, so, but you have, the thing that got our attention in the first place is the Ariza, Rabbi Isaac Luria. It sounds like he's making a playful, a playful wordplay. And he's saying Yom Kippur is like Purim. It's a shocking wordplay. First of all, to associate yeah. the two holidays in the first right. place is, is like surprising. Totally different. Right. But it's also even more shocking because he's taking what we consider the holiest day of the year, mm -hmm. according to many. And he's saying that, that really Purim is the model for what Yom Kippur is supposed to be. So he's saying Yom Kippur is Kip Purim. It's like Purim, which means that Purim is the real uh, example. And, and, and Yom Kippur is just like Purim, which is another kind of uh, 
kind of sort of surprising kind of playful element to this teaching. So we're assuming that he's pointing. He's not just giving us everything in that right. pithy kind of phrase, but rather he's pointing and that part of the process is to now look at these holidays and see what elements they seem to have in common. So, so far we find the lottery, it, that, that seems to be something that they have in common. And I'm suggesting to you another layer of something that they have in common is the, um, the Torah, re- accepting the Torah or receiving the Torah. And in both cases, there's sort of, uh, they have this similar quality because in the Yom Kippur story, it, 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 if he's bringing down the second tablets on Yom Kippur, that means there was something missing at the first tablets. He brought down the tablets, but something was going on and they couldn't accept them, right? right? So he had to break them. So now he's bringing them down. And this is sort of what's going on in that Agata, that Agatata, which is uh, the something was missing at the first receiving of the Torah. So they have to accept it at a, at a later time. So it's not just that you have accepting the Torah, but you have accepting the Torah, like a renewed acceptance, a kind of renewed acceptance. Now you could see this as part of the experience of Yom Kippur, because on Yom Kippur, you there's this spirit of repentance there's a perspective that a lot of us get on Yom Kippur where we're doing inventory and we feel like we've uh, had a chance to look at a lot of stuff that we've been ignoring and try to get a big picture in life and so we it's not uncommon for people to make commitments during that time to to uh, very careful right you have to be careful about those i it's my belief that it's part of the reason we say kol nidre at the beginning of yom kippur to uh to just remind ourselves you be careful about uh, when you what make you those said. kind of commitments but but the fact that we're making them that's like a renewed what you would call a renewed kind of acceptance a renewed a, a moment right. of renewal which so that is not just the fact that the second tablets come down, but it's also very much a, a part of the experience of the day mm-hmm. that, that we feel like um, we've come back to our, our senses in a certain way. And, and, and also, it, yeah. isn't it also that we're like standing on a precipice between one thing and the other? <laughs> between being accepted for the year by God or not, and here the right. lot right, right here, there. right. So right. this is my what I'm going to suggest is the similarity number three, ah. right? Again, these are these are just me. I mean, I'm just do, really? I'm just doing the looking. I, I I'm I'm not saying you have yeah. to think of these that way. But what Lois is, I think, yeah. mentioning now also is because on Yom on Purim. How did we get to the perspective? The well, there's that, but 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 also the but the pers- How did you get to the clarity on Purim, to the point where we're re-accepting uh, the Torah? We got there almost like having a mountain over our head. Haman is like the mountain right. over our head. The only thing, the only difference I would say between Haman and having a mountain over your head is that this Kimu Vakiblu didn't happen. It's not characterized as happening before when the people were pleading with God to save them. It happens in the aftermath, in the joy of being saved. In other words, the, because you could ask yourself, isn't this the same thing? What do they mean? Key movie that, that, yeah, it was forced during the time of Harsinai, but in the time of Purim, they're doing it not being forced. What are you talking about? A Haman came and wanted to destroy all the Jews. How did they get to this place where they are um, so grateful, et cetera, because they faced annihilation, not unlike 
the scenario with the mountain going over their head. They face annihilation and now they see their life sort of passing before them. They get perspective and, you know, and, but, but I think the only thing you could say that is different is the time in with the mountain over their head, they're expected to say at that moment that they accept the Torah. Whereas here, the mountain is no longer over their head. It was over their head, but now there's a kind of the joyous right. result afterwards um, that, and, and these acceptances, which are considered very significant, historically hugely significant from the Talmud. It's considering this, even though, again, it's coming in the kind of giddy aftermath of what was a potential total annihilation, it's considered a very deep, profound acceptance of Torah. And in Yom Kippur, you also have this, the way we celebrate Yom Kippur, where we emphasize that there is a judgment and that if we are not found worthy, we will die. That's part of like the Unasana Toka prayer, where uh, who by, and the uh, Leonard Cohn uh, song, Who by Fire, um, where, where we, in a certain sense, imagine ourselves um, hanging between life and death for a big chunk of the day, right? Um, so it has that element. It has that shared element that there is a, a fear of destruction that is hovering, that somehow gives us it hasn't gone away. perspective, <laughs> right? But it gives us a kind of perspective. And from the place of that perspective, we are accepting uh, responsibilities upon ourselves. So you could say that's another similarity uh, between Purim and Yom Kippur. They, so you have um, you have the acceptance of the Torah in both cases. You have an acceptance of the Torah that has similarities because in each case, it's a second chance. So it's like the Torah of second chances kind of thing. But then you also have this thing that like a, <coughs> there was a threat. There, were, there, is a, there is a threat that this perspective is coming because of a threat to our existence, which is So, um, and I wonder since yeah. since we in a way in a way did this by ourselves. Well, Esther through Esther's, you know that the reason God isn't mentioned in the Megillah is because the salvation now, just like Kibla, you know, it's coming from us, not from us. You know, it's it's kind of like almost. On purpose, God isn't being mentioned because the Jewish people have to do this by themselves. Now, but what is this? That that would be the question. What is this? What do, um, what do the Jews? The, uh, they have to do. Uh, they have to save themselves on their own. Unlike Egypt, unlike being taken out of Egypt, I, something like that. <sighs> you tread. It, although tread, Mordechai tread. Mordechai does say to Esther that you know salvation will will come from another place. I don't. You know, that might mean God. It might not. I don't. Um, yeah, so this should be about that. The truth is that you could say 
that that also is a part of Yom Kippur. Like that that issue of the the responsibility of the individual. Where does man's responsibility? Where's man's responsibility and where's God's responsibility? In in uh, so let's say there is a there's always a partnership theologically theologically let's say there's always some kind of partnership that it's not possible for the human being to do anything on their own strictly speaking because human beings don't don't have the control they don't have the power to do anything completely on their own we can't fly right or and we can't we, we really, there's very little that we can do completely on our own. Um, so you could say that, well, I can't necessarily do it on my own, but I could do it with other people. In other words, so it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be me on my own, but it still wouldn't necessarily necessitate God. But at some point, if you think it through, you're not going to get very many steps where God is going to have to be a partner in this, in, in whatever happens. This is <clears throat> this is an issue that is, uh, is sort of discussed but never you know fully explained exactly how it works because um at some point we acknowledge that if it isn't for god we couldn't uh, the basic underpinnings of life couldn't wouldn't exist and uh, the various elements of life wouldn't have continued existence. Um, and you could, you could get there on your own without having to be quoting Hasidic masters or, or theologians, that, it, that it, it would take a couple steps where you would feel like at this point, God is involved. That in, in other words, if, if, if anything is going to happen, it's gonna be a partnership between man and God. And the question then is, how much of the responsibilities on man and how, how much of the responsibilities on God. So for instance, you have uh, teachings that, uh, that will say something like uh, God opens, uh, a man makes a hole the size of the needle, of the hole in a, in a needle. And God, uh, God then opens it up to the size of a great hole. Or is that, in other words, that, it's the job of man to make an original effort. In Kabbalistic language, they call it isra usa dilatata, a, a kind of awakening from below that brings about awakening from above. And when we speak about blessings, that we um, say formulas that awaken um, divine energy that comes down in blessings and in prayer. But at some point, you come to the notion that there's a kind of partnership between God and man. The question is, like, when is it man, it's time for man to do man's stuff? And when is it time for God to do God's stuff? And so, uh, like, Rabbi Israel Salanter, uh, Rabbi Berowine quoted this a bunch of times, Rabbi Israel Salanter said that uh, when he first got married, he and his wife talked about it, and they agreed that if, if there are questions that have to do with the spiritual part of their family, he would get the final word. If it was questions that have to do with the material part of the family, she will get the final word. That's how they agreed to divvy up responsibilities. And then he said, and then they argued for the rest of their marriage about what was a spiritual issue and what was a material issue. So you, uh, yeah, so you could, um, you could see how, like, like for instance, um, when it comes to making a change, like uh, changing my behavior. So let's say I think to myself that I can't do anything without God. Right. So would it be appropriate for me to say, God, just change my behavior? <laughs> right. Because anyways, I can't do anything without God. So we would, I think, all agree. No, you're, you're supposed to make an effort. Maybe you need God's partnership in being successful. 
but you still have to make an effort. You have to make like some kind of effort. So the the so if Yom Kippur is about changing my behavior, then even though I'm spending a lot of time praying to God and thinking about God, but ultimately when it comes to these commitments, I have to do something. You have to make the first move. I have to do something to change because otherwise, what was the point? So, and you could say that Purim is, is that that's another expression of what Purim is. Ultimately, we don't believe Purim could happen without God. Nothing can happen without God. But why is it not emphasizing God's role in it? Be maybe this is, uh, it is another one of these interesting comparisons between Yom Kippur and Purim. It's not emphasizing God's role over there because this is the great model for change and uh, for taking responsibility for our work in this world. That's what it means. That's why they, what it means when it says they accept the Torah. What does it mean they accept the Torah? In other words, that they, they take responsibility for it, that I'm responsible for it. I'm going to own it. I'll own it. I own the Torah. Uh, but in other words, I, I own the responsibility for the Torah. It's on me. It's not on God. It's on me. If you ask me to the point where, I mean, this is ridiculous, but to the point where somebody would say, why did God cause the Holocaust? And, and it might be appropriate to say, God didn't cause the Holocaust. I caused the Holocaust, right? Because I'm supposed to take responsibility for everything that happens. This isn't uh, to teach me that I do nothing and I'm responsible for nothing. That, and that might be what the Kabbalah is, what the acceptance is on Purim, when, that, when it says that they're accepting the Torah. What's different from before? What's different from before is they felt it was voiced upon them, but they're not owning it. Now they're gonna own it. And part of owning it is, is, is taking responsibility for what you do and, and putting the responsibility on yourself and not just putting it on God and then, and then stepping away. Right. And that could be another one of those things for Yom Kippur, because if I'm going to change, then I have to take responsibility for my actions. I, I ha and so it could be that you're learning so that from Purim. responsibility for your non-actions. And my non-actions. Yeah. Do you Wait. see um, Kimu Vakiblu as kind of like um, the opposite of uh, Nasev and Nishma, in other words, the two things reverse in a little ways. So, well, uh, <laughs> one, well, they're, one they're, you're going to do it and, you know, you'll listen or something, maybe. And the other is you're confirming it and you're accepting it, you know. But the thing so, is that like, like uh, Tosfus over there asks on the Gemara in Shabbos about the mountain. Tosfus asked, what happened to Kimo Vakiblu? Mm. and in other words they, they already committed they're going to do it I mean not Kimo Vakiblu what happened in Nasa and Nishma? what happened right. in Nasa and Nishma? they already said they're going to do it even if they don't understand it so why do they need a mountain over their head so Tosfus says because if you, if you look at the description at Sinai the people became frightened they became so frightened they stepped back mm -hmm. so he's, he's suggesting they step back from Nasa and Nishma. So uh -huh. the Rao uh, of Prague doesn't like that. And he has some explanation to try to fix that because he doesn't like that, that they step back from Nasim and Nishba. But Ramosha Shapiro points out that in the language, it says they step back from Nasim and Nishba. In, in the telling of the story in Devarim, I mean, in the, you know, the Eschanon. Devarim. So in the, so you have the retelling of the of the you know the whole event with the ten statements, mm -hmm. and then it says, "God spoke these words in a loud voice to your entire assembly from the mountain, out of the fire, cloud, and mist." But he added no more. He wrote these words on two stone tablets, and he later gave them to me. When you heard the voice out of the darkness with the mountain burning in flames, your tribal leaders and elders approached me. You said, 
It is true that God our Lord has showed us his glory and greatness, and we've heard his voice out of the fire. Today we have seen that when God speaks to man, he can still survive. But now, why should we die? Why should this great fire consume us? If we hear the voice of a God, Lord, anymore, we will die. What mortal has heard the voice of the living God speaking out of the fire as we did and has survived? You approach God, our Lord, and listen to all he says. You can transmit to us whatever God tells you. We will hear it, and we will do it. <laughs> really? It. They so when it's it. repeated, when it's... Yeah, so huh. they actually tell this point. But, and so, so Ramosha Shapiro was saying, this is where Tosas gets it. They actually say it. They got uh -huh. scared and they go. Uh -huh. We will hear it and then we will do it. They actually switch. Nazanishma. So that's why uh -huh. God, you know, is holding the mountain over them, as it were, you yeah. know, forcing them to do it because they themselves switch because they got afraid. So, so that's how typically the way it's understood is that it came of a Kiblu, it got corrected again. Mm -hmm. The Nas of Anishma. But I like, I mean, I think you could play with that. I think okay. I think you've done well today, Lois. I think you've uh... I can I just say one thing and I hope this doesn't bother <laughs> um you know a, a lot of midrashim I have learned. Yeah, I go it takes you deeper into meanings and all over. But I been you know, some of the midrash about of the Megillah seems to be the rabbis just not accepting what they want to say it's almost like they make excuses i, I can't explain it. they they come up with these things that don't that actually go against the story instead of going deeper into it to me to me you, you know like try, i'm saying but you you could when you see that happen yeah i'm suggesting to you look where they're pointing don't don't just finish with what they're saying this, this i try is of, i I know, I know. Just well, look like Mordechai, you know, like Haman was wearing, I don't know, an idol on his, you know, that they, they had to explain why Mordechai, it's all right for someone to bow down to someone else. So they had to explain why Mordechai didn't. But that's what you know, I'm saying. You're just, for some all right, reason, all right. Or that Esther was that. green, or that Esther was green, or that, or that it wasn't the king sleeping, it was God. I don't know. There's just so I'm much in this. Every one of these are an example of you stopping with what they said okay okay don't stop with what they said go I further i try i try because but because i always try to do that with a midrash not, you know you're not for some from reason. your teaching and from aviva zornberg's teaching i try that all the time and i get and i get it but in these i just right. i just want to kick them and say keep looking she's having come, trouble finding it keep looking you, you come have to back to the story don't distort no. the story come they're back. not because you're uh, all you're, right you're stuck on their words you're just you're paying too much attention to their words you're stuck on well them. i you have to go I can see where they're going but it no yeah. that makes it that's all where right. you're getting that's where you're getting okay up. okay you think thank you, know. you. <laughs> Go oh, farther. I'm telling you, even things like this, the simple, sometimes they are the simplest thing. And then suddenly open up worlds. Just let it, you, but you have to like step back and just see beyond what you're, if, if, if you're getting stuck on the words, then but I see what do something. Go farther. I also do, yeah. but she's stuck on the, I'm just yeah. saying you're, you're just stuck on the words. They're not nah. just saying. No, it's, it's the idea. It's the idea. It's no. an excuse. It's an no. excuse. Okay. No. Okay. Thank you, Rabbi. I'm so right. glad we had class today. Me too. <laughs> yes. Me too. Yes. Take care. Me too. Take All care. right, guys. Be well. Bye-bye. Be well. Bye-bye. Good shop. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Shabbat shalom. 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 Shabbat shalom.